Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ignazio Muso. I am the third person that you see in the in the in the invitation, and uh, I would just say a few word a few words to introduce this this meeting. Uh, last week uh, we had uh, a very interesting uh, meeting with uh, Mr. Schubert of the European Central Bank and uh, the, the topic was the role of Europe and the European community within uh, uh, this globalization process which is the main, uh, the main topic of your courses. Uh, today we are focusing uh, on, the, on the emerging economies in the globalization process, specifically the two most important emerging economies, China and India, and uh, to introduce uh, the, 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 uh, the, the discussion and also to present uh, the, the issues, uh, we have invited to a professor from the University of Turin, which I now uh, will introduce, uh, Professor Vittorio Valli and Professor Giovanni Balsé. They are economists of the University of, of Turin, and they are working since a long time on a research concerning comparison between China and India. It is very interesting to analyze these two big economies uh, which are very different and compare their performance uh, in the globalization process. Um, what uh, uh, Vittorio and Giovanni have recently done is to write a book, which unfortunately is in Italian, uh, a book uh, um, where uh, they presented the outcomes of a research group of the University of Turin and other Italian universities on the, uh, these two uh, economies of uh, China and India. So they will uh, first present uh, uh, something uh, of their research. Um, Vittorio Valli is, is more a specialist in macroeconomics issues and Giovanni Balsé, on the contrary, is a, is a specialist in industrial issues, so they will, they will focus on these two particular aspects. And after, I will say something about China. I am not an expert in India, but I have the opportunity of uh, working a bit on the Chinese economy. So, as a sort of discussion, I will, uh, I will say something about China uh, after their presentation. Thank you to everybody. Uh, our research has been done with a research group uh, made by many people that uh, we had uh, tried to compare the economic uh, long run growth of China and India. Uh, actually, uh, as we will see, the difference in the economic growth pattern are several differences, are many differences. While uh, there are also some similarities, but uh, I think that the difference between the two countries and the two economies are more numerous than the similarities in uh, the pattern of economic growth. Uh, we start from uh, uh, this uh, little table in which uh, we compare the level of uh, gross domestic product in uh, purchasing power parities of uh, China and India uh, in percentage of uh, the level in each date in uh, 1820, 1870, 1913 and so on of uh, uh, gross domestic product of the United States that is now the most important economy in the world. And as we can see, in the 80s, in the 19th century, both in 1820 and in 1870, the largest economy in the world were not the uh, United Kingdom or France or Germany or the United States, but were China and India. Uh, but, uh, as you know, 
uh, in the 19th century, there were different forms of colonialism, in which, uh, with uh, uh, the domination of the United Kingdom on India from one side, and uh, the unequal treaties from the other side between uh, uh, the Western powers and uh, China, there was a progressive economic weakening of uh, China and India that I called uh, a relative economic decline of China and India vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world and vis-à-vis -vis the Western powers. So that uh, in uh, 1913, as you can see, uh, China has fell down to only less than half the total gross domestic product of the United States, and uh, India has fallen down to less than 40% of the level of the United States. So actually there was, uh, between 1870 and 1913, the economic ascent of the United States <coughs> as uh, the largest economic power not yet the largest political, military, and economic power, but uh, the largest economic power as such. Uh, and uh, uh, a tremendous decline, a tremendous fall of uh, the economic power of China and India. Uh, as you see, uh, the fall is uh, going on, has gone on, has continued from uh, 1913 and 1950, although there was the First World War, the terrible period between the two wars with the Nazis and the fascist movement and so on, and uh, the Second World War. So there were a lot of changes, but uh, the economic situation of China and India worsened, continued to worsen, vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So, in 1950, we have probably the period in which, in relative terms, there was the hegemony of uh, the United States as the world's largest economy. The second world's largest economy was the Soviet Union, the period. And China and India were a very small economy, especially in terms of uh, uh, per capita, gross domestic product, they were very poor economies, but only for total gross domestic product, and so the total size of the market vis-à-vis -vis the United States. But, uh, as you can see, in uh, the last uh, uh, period, from uh, 1950 up to now, and especially in China since uh, 1978, uh, since uh, the beginning of the economic reform of Deng Xiaoping, the radical economic reform of Deng Xiaoping up to now, and in India since, uh, to some extent, the mid-80s, but especially since uh, 1992, with the radical economic reform of 1992, there was uh, a catching up, a beginning of a catching up, a beginning of uh, gradual but a rapid process of catching up of both economies so that uh, according to uh, Madison estimate China in uh, 2010 had even surpassed uh, even taken over the size of the economy of the United States uh, but according to other estimates, uh, the World Bank estimate it has uh, come up only to almost 70% of the level of the United States, and uh, India has come up about 29% of the level of the United States, but from 15% and 13% in 1950. So there was a, a very rapid catching up of uh, China, in terms of the size of the market, in terms of total gross domestic product, not yet in terms of per capita gross domestic product, and a more radical but uh, uh, good uh, catching up since 1992 of India. That's to give you a general overview of economic trends. And if we go to the other question, 
uh, the other data, we can see uh, that uh, if we concentrate on the latest period, the most recent period, from 1978 uh, up to now, we can see that uh, there was a big acceleration of the rate of growth of real gross domestic product of China and uh, a smaller acceleration of India in that period, uh, while from uh, 1991 up to now, there has been a, a, an increasing acceleration of uh, the rate of growth of China to 9.5 and uh, a good acceleration of the rate of growth of India from 4 to 0.5 to 6.9, almost 7 percent, for real gross domestic product. In terms of per capita gross domestic product, you must take into account also the rate of growth of uh, population. Uh, so, as you know, the rate of growth of per capita gross domestic product is uh, more, more or less equal to the rate of growth of gross domestic product minus the rate of growth of population. So you can see that also for the real per capita gross domestic product, there has been a, a very rapid acceleration of growth in China in that period, and a substantial acceleration, more than double acceleration, also in India after 1991. So that uh, demos, uh, shows that uh, uh, economic growth has uh, picked up in the two countries uh, in different ways, as we will see, but uh, uh, especially from 78, or more than 35 years ago in China, and especially from 1992, for, for 20, 20 years in India. So almost 15 years later than in China. That is important in order to compare the level reached by the two countries today. Then uh, we can see that uh, we can see that uh, all of these trends has happened during the second wave of globalization. According to historians, actually probably this is the third wave of globalization because there was a uh, first wave of globalization in uh, the 17th century and uh, part of 18th century, but uh, usually the economists uh, concentrate on the two last waves of globalization. One wave between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century until the First World War, the first wave of globalization, according to most economists, and secondly, uh, the, a second wave of globalization from the 70s up to now, the last uh, uh, 30 years, or more or less. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, 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 acceleration of economic growth in, in both countries happened during the second wave of globalization. Happening. Uh, thanks uh, to some extent uh, to the globalization process, even though the globalization process has had also negative effect both on uh, India and China and uh, in Western countries, positive and negative effects. Uh, there is an important difference between uh, uh, the first and the second wave of globalization between, because uh, while the first wave of globalization has been made up between independent states, uh, between the big uh, Western powers, for instance, and uh, between the center and the periphery of the great colonial empires. Uh, the second wave of globalization happened between uh, all independent states, even though with very different economic, political, and military strength that must be taken into account. Uh, so uh, there was a qualitatively different, the first wave of globalization and the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, and the last wave of globalization. Because the first wave 
was uh, <laughs> very much concentrated on the relation between the center of the periphery of the colonial empire. And the colonial empire has dissolved uh, uh, before the second wave of globalization. Now, uh, we uh, gave uh, some uh, data, some indicators, basic indicators about uh, uh, the, <coughs> the way in which uh, globalization has happened in the two countries. If we take the degree of openness of the two countries, of commercial openness, trade openness of the two countries, so import plus export of goods and services divided by two in percentage of gross domestic product, we see that uh, China, from a, a low level of a degree of openness, 14% in 1990, rapidly gas to 33.3%, a very high level of openness, uh, of uh, commercial openness. While India has increased uh, very much from uh, the beginning of the 2000, up to, uh, from uh, 1992 up to now, but uh, is now at the level of openness that is less than the level reached by China in 2000. That's important in order to compare the economic records of the two countries. As regards also the attraction of uh, uh, foreign direct investment of the two countries, we can see that uh, uh, the stock of uh, inward foreign direct investment, uh, the foreign, foreign direct investment going to China from other countries is increased very much, especially in the 90s and up to 2000, has uh, continued to increase the level of the stock but not the percentage from 2000 to 2010. Uh, why? there was a rapid increase in the outflow, outward, of foreign direct investment from China to other countries in the recent years. That's very important, and, and uh, my colleague Giovanni will uh, uh, concentrate also on this aspect. <coughs> While India has uh, a less uh, increase in uh, foreign direct investment uh, both inward and outward than China. Uh, then we concentrate on uh, uh, the main difference between the two transition economies because we can consider both the economies as transition economy. But while China is a classical a transition economy from a planned economy to a mixed economy, uh, India is uh, in a transition from a mixed economy with a very great uh, role of the state to uh, always a mixed economy but uh, with a lesser uh, importance of the state in the economy. Uh, more particularly, I have called uh, the China system uh, a system of the triple mix because there is a mix between the plane and the market. There is a mix between a centralized and a decentralized system. Between, there is a mix between public and private ownership of the means of production. But uh, the trend has been a change between uh, all plan and no market in 1978 to a mix of plan and market with the increasing size of the market. Uh, between an all centralized system, almost all centralized system in 1978 to a system that is increasingly decentralized and uh, uh, a system where the, the means of production are almost totally public in 1978 and now uh, is increasing, there is increasing share of private ownership of the means of production. So, uh, China has always had uh, this triple mix, but uh, with a trend uh, towards the second end of the mix, each element of the mix. Then there was also a, 
a transition from an authoritarian, monoparty, highly centralized political system to a gradually more decentralized system, almost authoritarian, almost monoparty, but a gradually more decentralized system with the growing power of local authorities and of uh, also private capital and also some, uh, some uh, injection of uh, power of uh, uh, foreign capital controlling joint venture in the China market. Uh, then there was uh, a change from a very closed economy up to the 90s to a rapidly open economy as we have seen with the la latest indicators. While India was a mixed economy, it remains a mixed economy, but a much more liberal, liberalized economy, both internal and external, and uh, a decrease in public regulation. Uh, India was characterized by a, a very great uh, presence of the state in the economy, both with public enterprise, public banks, and uh, with a, a very a heavy network of regulation on the system, and that was uh, gradually reduced uh, from 1992 up to now. Now, uh, I add uh, some other indicators very rapidly. I uh, will ask you about it. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, the two countries have a very large population. China, 1 billion and 300,000 uh, uh, million people. India, almost one, 1 billion and 200 million people. But uh, notice that the average annual rate of growth of population of China is now, in the last period, only 0.6 in the last decade. While in India, has gone down to 1.6, but is triple, more than three times the level of, almost three times the level of China. And so, as we will see, China will have in the future the problem of aging, and there is the beginning of the problem of aging in China, because of the demographic policy made in the past, while India for at least two decades will not have this problem we probably have in four or five decades. So there's a very different demographic pattern in the two countries. Uh, as uh, we see, in 1978, uh, India had a, a per capita level, a level of per capita gross domestic product higher than China. But China surpassed India, and now has more than double the level of per capita gross domestic product of India. The rate of growth of uh, and, uh, other indicators you can see. One important thing is uh, uh, the human development index that is uh, less in China than in India, in the sense that the position, the rank is better in China than in India, and the average level of education that is better in China than in India. Another important indicator is the balance of current accounts, because in the last 10 years, China has accumulated every year a very large surplus in, in the balance part of current accounts, while India had uh, uh, alternating level, and for instance, in 1911, in, in 2011, he had uh, a deficit in, uh, of uh, 62, 63 uh, billion dollars. Uh, and then finally, uh, inequalities. Uh, China has a very low inequality before the economy reforms, and now it's uh, one of the high level of uh, inequality measure for instance for, with the Gini coefficients. And the uh, inequalities are very high, both uh, territorially between regions, between provinces in China, and uh, between among families. And uh, it's uh, even higher than the level of the United States, similar to the level of the United States. While India is uh, 
a level of inequality more or less equal to the level of Italy. So, uh, lower than the level of the United States. Now, I will pass uh, uh, the floor to my colleague. Uh, there are other problems that we can okay. treat away, but it's better to pass the floor to my colleague. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I too, I, I, I want to thank very much uh, uh, Venice International uh, University and Professor Ignazio Muzo for inviting us today. It's a really a pleasure to, to be here. Um, and uh, um, I'd like to stress that the, the, the approach we followed in the, this uh, research work was uh, to exploit the comparative economic system analysis uh, to highlight uh, differences and similarities and that was a very effective uh, methodology. And uh, as you have seen from the presentation of Vittorio, we try to appreciate uh, the, the long run, long run evolution. Uh, so it's a, it's a long run approach. And moreover, our approach uh, is based on the assumption that history matters. We don't think that the recent developments in China can be explained simply starting the story in uh, 1978. We don't think that the recent develop developments in uh, India can maybe uh, expl fully explain uh, on um, analyzing what happened after 1992. But we think that also the preceding decades of planet economy of uh, import substitution, industrialization, anyway shape the, the economic systems uh, and the economic structure and so uh, affected what, what followed. And finally, we think that policies matter and the institutions uh, matter. So that's our, our starting point I'd like to, uh, to stress. Um, in uh, the, 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 the context uh, of uh, industrial growth is that of a rapid industrialization uh, since uh, many decades now in China, uh, deeper than, than India. Uh, while in India, industrialization process is less wide, it's, it is delayed vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, and, and the role of services uh, is still mu much more important. Uh, the, 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 the share of industry in, uh, in value added and employment is very, very impressive in, uh, in, uh, in China. It is not the case uh, uh, for India. Uh, and China, in our interpretation, really exploited the advantages of uh, uh, relative economic backwardness in, in, in the classical, uh, classical way and uh, the fourth model of development. One, one chapter written by, by Vittorio deepened this uh, uh, for this model application to, to both countries. The financial system is much larger mm -hmm. but less sophisticated in China, even that there was a, a, very, a very significant evolution, more sophisticated and articulated but smaller in, uh, in India. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, we, uh, Vittorio told something about inequalities, and uh, uh, one, one chapter of our book is about uh, uh, environment, environmental problems uh, and uh, pollution is wider and uh, more rapid, gr rapidly growing in China. Uh, but uh, in recent years, uh, policies uh, uh, took some very significant steps. And in some cases, the uh, environmental uh, problem became uh, um, from a challenge, an opportunity uh, for developing new, new green technology uh, with very, very fast catch technological catching up. It's the case of uh, uh, alternative, uh, yes, uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, panels production. Uh, and, uh, well, in the, 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 it, it was not the case in, uh, in, uh, in India. Uh, some significant insights may be uh, provided by the one, one case study uh, of, of one significant industry that is automotive industry and uh, that's very complex it's uh, vertically integrated very articulated with the deep impact on economy and on society on employment 
And uh, that's, that's interesting to compare the two cases because the, the supply side structure <coughs> is completely different. Completely different. Uh, China is very striking because now it's the biggest uh, uh, automotive market in the world, surpassed the US in uh, 2009, something like uh, 18 million vehicles, so all, all included. It's very, very impressive uh, size and growth rate. Uh, over two years, the growth rate was very, very impressive uh, uh, during the crisis in, in Western countries. 2009-2010, uh, the rate of growth of this, uh, this, special, this specific industry was uh, higher than 30% per year. And it's, of course, slowed down in 2011, uh, but it, it is still very, very impressive. And it is a very, very highly fragmented industry. Uh, with uh, tens and tens of producers of cars or any kind of vehicles, with some emerging national champions. champions. Chinese policy would like to support national champions, but maybe also in connection with this boom of the demand side, that they have not up to now be, uh, been able to really make those national champions emerge. Um, the, the main actors are <coughs> quite differentiated. First of all, we have the, the joint ventures with the uh, uh, Chinese partner that usually is a um, is, uh, state-owned enterprise, but uh, uh, in most cases not central state, but the local state, province or municipalities. So the, the pattern is uh, uh, public the state ownership, but local state ownership, uh, with uh, a Western or Japanese, uh, American, or European, or Korean multinational. Mm -hmm. That's the, the main actor in the Chinese market. This joint venture, this joint venture are imposed by legislation. Foreign multinationals are not allowed to own uh, an assembly line more than 50 percent. Mm -hmm. So they are obliged to, to have a, a local partner. Now they can choose. Uh, in one month, uh, the Italian multinational Fiat uh, will restart <laughs> after years to produce cars in, in, uh, in China. They choose uh, a province owned uh, Guangdong uh, Automotive uh, Corporation um, and they were free to choose the partners, at least. But they are, they are not free to, to take over, to have the ownership. They, they can own the factory of engines, uh, R&D center, if you want, but not uh, an assembly line. Uh, and finally, there are also other actors, so new private Chinese companies that are very, very a minority, but very dynamic. And they are also the actors of uh, acquisition or, or multinational expansion abroad. For example, the, the company that acquired, took the control of Volvo in 2010 is a private, very, with a very lower technological level, but a lot of cash, of course and uh, private and very, and very dynamic. So, in China it is a highly regulated uh, industry. They define the pillar industry, so it, it's a focus in, uh, in uh, industrial policy, uh, submitted to a lot of uh, regulation of policies at national and regional level. Mm -hmm. National level means ministries and is a super policy maker. That, and DRC, and I think uh, uh, Professor uh, Muzu will explain better than me, but it, it, it's uh, uh, the, the continuation of the former uh, planning authority, if you want, uh, and uh, is a sort of super uh, ministry uh, that uh, sometimes in contradiction with uh, the, the powers of ministry, uh, gives some guidelines uh, for industrial policy. While in India, in this industry, the, the transition was more or less uh, over, was completed. The transition uh, based on the, the principle that the Tory was, was describing. Because in the past, it was a very, very highly <coughs> regulated sector. It was within the, the so-called license raj, uh, strictly regulated. And uh, over 20 years, there, there was a deregulation, liberalization process. And this evolution is well represented by the story of the, the leader. Half of the Indian market is, is controlled uh, on the supply side by one, one producer, it's Maruti, 
that was a joint venture between a uh, state-owned uh, and uh, enterprise and uh, Japanese multinational Suzuki, uh, had a very important role over 20 years to shape uh, really uh, upgrade technology and modernize this industry, and then was faded out with the liberalization, became a majority of the foreign affiliates, very well integrated in Suzuki network with the biggest R&D center outside Japan, etc. So there was a historical role, very important, and this kind of evolution. But uh, also in, in, both, uh, in both countries, we must stress, also in the case of India, there was a gradualist, gradualist approach in transition. So they, they uh, retarded it in order to let the, the Indian companies grow. Uh, Indian companies are, uh, <coughs> all of you, you know uh, the, the Tata group, uh, there are other uh, groups that are usually part of conglomerate groups, again for historical reasons, many. Uh, so the, the car industry uh, is part of a very diversified por portfolio of activity. These are, for example, Mahindra and Mahindra. Bharat Forge is a, a metallurgist component suppliers. And, uh, and the, 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 this is the, the dominant pattern of governance. Family controlled, uh, family ownership, and uh, uh, conglomerate. Mm? And uh, so industrial policies are still at work, especially at state level, uh, but the, the, the was, uh, uh, there was a, a transition that uh, um, obtained a, a final scenario very, very different from the Chinese one. Um, on, the, on technological ground, uh, uh, joint ventures in both, in both countries, in India mainly main in the past, in China today, were a very important instrument of learning and eh, transferring technology, but transferring technology in a cooperative way, in, the, in a cre creative way. Eh. In both countries there was a sort of uh, imi at, um, creative imitation and so recombination of, the, of knowledge and uh, very, very interesting ph phenomena of appropriation and combination of, of uh, knowledge and new engineering of this kind of products. Mm? And uh, interesting to note, in, in some cases, uh, in China there is the joint venture and there are other ways of catching up the technology, for example, reverse engineering, the pure imitation, uh, and uh, the cre creation of new product architecture, etc. So, Chinese, uh, uh, have a, a multinational brand in, in, um, in joint venture and they also have their own brand. They try to transfer technology <coughs> from the first to the second. And multinationals sometimes try to delay this transfer of technology, N not to transfer the really last, last generation, but uh, taking uh, alive some, some time gap in this kind of process. Um, and why in, in the case of India, this Joint venture played this historical uh, historical uh, uh, role in shaping the, the, the industry, especially, I uh, must say, in this case, the role of uh, uh, Japanese multinationals was really very important, uh, pulled by, by uh, Suzuki Motors, many uh, important suppliers took part in these very complex uh, uh, international global value chains. Uh, uh, affecting these countries. And finally, two leapfrogging opportunities. In this moment, in the last two years, two ca both countries think they have a leapfrogging opportunities. That, that means to be the first on a future uh, frontier, technological frontier. Chinese think the uh, opportunity is, uh, uh, is the electric vehicle. And they are investing, they are uh, building very important policies, uh, at the uh, central government, a uh, group of important cities, etc. They think they, they know the technology of batteries and they, uh, they think they are able to reshape uh, the grid, the electric grid, in order to, <laughs> to develop uh, this, this kind of, uh, of new technology that needs a new, a new smart grid to work. And uh, in, interesting enough, we have private actors in the, we have the policies and private actors. Uh, this is a BYD, that means uh, build your dream, 
is, uh, is one private uh, producer of uh, batteries, is the providing the batteries to Nokia, etc. Not only batteries, also electronic content. They, they started to diversify in electric vehicle. And they made a, a GV with Daimler Benz, so it's a very serious thing. Uh, in the case of, of India, they, they think that their opportunity is the ultra low cost vehicle, the, the well known, very, very small, light, and very low cost uh, nano model by, produced by, uh, by Tata Group. Eh? And in both cases, we cannot say that they, they reach the commercial uh, success uh, in the two strategies. So it's, uh, there are very interesting uh, processes at technological level. Well, the, the market success uh, is not yet come, I think, in both cases. So we see the development of that. Um, I, I, conclu I conclude uh, um, in, the, in, the, in this uh, case study of, the, of this industry, as, as in other industry, we, we see a very, we can observe a very interesting phenomenon, also from the point of view of economic theory. And th that is new multinationals, new multinational or, or transnational corporations based in China or India, as in the case of other, some other emerging country, Brazil, for example. Uh, but in China, uh, sometimes, in most of cases, there are uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, local or central state, again. In the case of India, usually they are private uh, enterprises. But anyway, they invest not only in other developing or emerging country, sort of south-south at the eye, but also in Europe, uh, in US, in Australia, etc. So it's a sort of south-north at the eye. And that's, and that's a relatively new, uh, new, I mean, uh, last ten, in the last 10 years. And uh, wh what are the drivers? Well, of course, access to foreign markets mm, in a better way than simply exporting, and access to natural resources, energy, land, commodities, the role of China in Africa, Chinese co co uh, companies in Africa, but also, and that's the case of South North FDI, foreign direct investment, access to new technology and to foreign well known brands. And that's uh, what uh, in uh, international business literature is called asset seeking strategies, asset seeking drivers motivation. Uh, and, and in that, that case, uh, uh, we don't have a greenfield operation or joint venture, we have acquisition or of uh, important brands. And that's the case of this uh, Tata Motor acquisition of Jaguar Land Rover 2008, and this private Geely acquired Volvo, but before Volvo they acquired other things, including uh, an important uh, uh, supplier of um, uh, gearboxes uh, based in Australia. Uh, so they, they, acquire, they acquire a company, a brand abroad, in order to uh, get the, the, the knowledge of the technology and, and to exploit the, in, the, in their own uh, network. And that, that's very interesting. That's very interesting because finally it's, it's the reverse of uh, uh, relocation of production abroad, as we, we imagine usually from a high wage to a low wage country. In this case, we have, uh, we have companies based in low wage countries. They invest abroad. They make acquisition, of course. Uh, and they, they produce abroad in a high wage. They don't stop the production to export from India or from China. They continue to produce in, produce in Germany, etc. And that's uh, also a challenge uh, for economic theory. I, I teach uh, international economics. Maybe, um, and uh, it, it is a, a challenge for uh, the, the theories based on factor endowment, endowment uh, because of course uh, we have to, okay. No, no, it, it's uh, the last one. And uh, so we conclude uh, uh, together with this, uh, uh, some question about the future trends and uh, challenges. Uh, and um, uh, the first uh, uh, question is about uh, the, of the political and, and social ground, uh, because uh, the, these very uh, fast growth uh, processes uh, challenge uh, the political systems, especially China, of course, where there is a sort of rigidity, and uh, 
the question is uh, how long the political system will be able to absorb the, the, the tension created by the, the growth itself uh, without, uh, without deeper changes. Eh? And in, in India also there are imbalances uh, and uh, the, the political stability is challenged by, by this, uh, the economic growth. Uh, and the demography, as Vittorio stressed, uh, in, in China the aging of population will be, will be a challenge. They will face the same problem that we face in, the, in Europe uh, or in more developed countries where, where uh, population is, uh, is uh, aging, while in India, ex ante, they should have a sort of windows of 10, 20 years where the, the growth, natural growth rate of population is, is perfect for, for economic growth because it's not too high nor too low. But the question is how they will, uh, this uh, ex ante potentiality will really be, be, be exploited and will, uh, will be traduced in, in, uh, in uh, growth rate. Hmm? Um, and, um, and so finally, the, 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 que the question we can arise from this uh, economic analysis are also on the uh, policy, political, and also on the, the social, social ground, uh, because uh, uh, it's important to evaluate if the, the two systems will be able to reduce the, the economic inequalities that have been rising very, very, very fast. And uh, as Professor Musu showed in his book, uh, in other works, uh, the transition in China was uh, much faster on a social ground than economic ground. They're very gradualist on economic ground, but they, they changed very rapidly there. The, the social policies, and that, that created a lot of inequalities, as we have seen from the, from the figures we presented. The last slide that uh, uh, Giovanni presented, there were a lot of uh, some questions about uh, the challenges for China and India, and probably what I should have done is to try to answer to, to both type of questions, both for China and for India. But I, as I said before, I have not enough knowledge of the Indian situation to, to try to respond to the, to, the, to the questions concerning the Indian economy, but I can try to do something uh, on China. Because uh, uh, what, 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 what we have when we study the, the recent experience of the Chinese economy, which is Chinese society after the, during the reform period, which started as a, Professor Valley mentioned before, immediately at the end of the 60s, 70s, after Mao Zedong, uh, what we have is a sort of paradoxical situation. Because we, we have market development, but with a very strong public presence in the, in the economy. So in the economic area, we have uh, what uh, Professor Valley said before, China moved from a completely planned economy to a, partial, a mixed economy. Okay, while well, India was a mixed economy and is now more a market economy. China still remains a mixed economy with uh, a lot of market development, but uh, as I will try to, to show, uh, a strong presence of, of, the, of the government in the economy. On the contrary, in the social area, there was a complete liberalization. Complete liberalization. Particularly in two sectors, the health sectors and the social insurance sectors. And then China showed the continuously deteriorating environment in, the last, uh, in your last slide. You were asking two different questions. Uh, for China, it was much more intriguing than for, for India. Now, I have just collected a number of uh, uh, slides, presented uh, uh, very quickly uh, s something about China. China, you see here you have... Uh, this is the, 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 the... This is GDP. You see it's increasing, incredibly increase, an exponential increase. 
was not touched uh, even by the last, uh, only, only in a minor way by the last uh, depression, by the last crisis. And if you start from here, the, there was a fluctuation in the rate of growth, but still the rate of growth remains in numbers which is inconceivable here in Europe. Uh, between 9% to 13% before the last, uh, the last economic crisis. Now, uh, China, uh, now uh, uh, in terms of export, uh, is above the United States. In terms of manufacturing uh, uh, output, my output is above the uh, United States. In, in terms uh, of uh, share in world manufacturing output according to OECD, China here, uh, you see, th this is China. Every uh, United States, Europe, Japan, they all decline in terms of shares on the world manufacturing output, while China is increasing. Now it's uh, around 25% of the world manufacturing output. So an increasingly brilliant economic performance in terms of model. Why? Well, but there are some problems. Even if we limit ourselves to the uh, economic aspect. For example, China, this is an comp international comparison. So you have a, a number of countries here. Do you see? This is China. China now, see this is the share of investment and saving on GDP, almost 50%. Absolutely, extremely high. The specularity is in consumption. China is also an outlier in consumption. This is, this is the different countries. But if you focus on China, you see that China, in terms of consumption of GDP, is a bit more than 40%. But this is total consumption, included public consumption. If we, if we move to household consumption, you see that now China is 35% of GDP, absolutely completely different from any experience of, for example, our mature economies. This is a clear imbalance in the, in, the, in the economic growth model of China, which must be corrected. Uh, our, so this is a, a big challenge. You know, next October Ch Ch in China there will be a, a passage to the new generational leadership. Uh, China will uh, enter into the fifth generational leadership and there will be a new president, a new general secretary of the party, a new prime minister. And this of rebalancing the growth model is certainly the first challenge that they, they, they have. Rebalancing the growth model more towards consumption, less uh, in terms of investment and saving, and also reducing the role of exports in, as a main driver of, of growth. There is a big success in terms of education, research and development. You see this is in terms uh, of uh, absolute growth and in terms of share on GDP, research and development expenditure have grown exceptionally. So this is an important success in terms of investment in human <coughs> capital and in research infrastructures. However, uh, this, is, this is something that shows uh, how the, there was this transition on market economy because, as you can see, the state-owned enterprise okay, has declined uh, in terms of number, in terms of asset share, in terms of employment share. And, however, the rate of return, uh, the, the, the profitability of uh, uh, state-owned uh, enterprises is lower than the rate of, of return of non-state-owned uh, uh, enterprises. Remember that in China, during the third generation of power, of leadership, uh, that uh, related to the names of uh, Jiang Zemin as the president of the Chinese Republic, and to this uh, uh, prime minister, later Zhu Rongji, there was a big restructuring of the state-owned enterprise, enterprise sector, 
which produced a real breakdown in terms of social stability in, in China. Also the banking sector, the banking sector in China, as you can see, more than 55% uh, are uh, owned, dominated, are public. And 22.5% uh, uh, you have a, a strong public presence, so there is some private shareholding. So, the, the whole banking sector is. Uh, in one of the slides you presented on China, the financial sector in China, in, in India, the financial sector in India is much more similar to, smaller than China, similar to uh, a mixed economy, and uh, the capitalist economy, let's say. Uh, so there is still a lot to do in terms of moving China towards what we I think is a market economy. China, the Chinese want to, uh, to, to be declared at the international level now a market economy, but they have still something to, to, to do. Uh, then there is this uh, second aspect of unbalance in the growth uh, model of China, which is the relation between economic and social situation. You have here um, an indication also in terms of, of, other, of other countries how inequality growth uh, grew in, uh, in, in China. All these uh, slides, I, I simply I, I took them from a recent, a very interesting report of the World Bank, uh, which is uh, the title is China, uh, China in 2030. And the interesting thing about this report is that it has been produced by the World Bank, but in strict cooperation with a research center in China, which is called Development and Research Center, which is very important because it's the research center of the uh, State Council. The State Council in China is similar to what is here, the, minister, the government. So, it is very interesting that uh, the State Council in China has accepted this analysis. This is very important for, for, uh, for uh, trying to understand what is happening in China. They are accepting this type of analysis. So they realize and they recognize that they have uh, to correct a macroeconomic type of uh, um, disequilibrium and they have also to correct a social type of disequilibrium. Here, for example, see how different is the GDP per capita in different regions of China. And this is another aspect of the social, uh, the social challenge, aging of population. Giovanni just uh, said that India has a sort of, uh, you, you mentioned the demographic advantage because they have still some years before starting to, to age in China, due also to the one child policy is now aging very fast and you will and you see here in 2050 the, the percent of total population above uh, 60s uh, over 60s is more than 35 percent but if you go to the how you you deal with 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 elderly people how do you deal with social security pensions in china are among the worst the, 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 the worst in the situation compared to other, to other countries. There have been attempts to reform. Now, especially in the rural area where there, are, there was practically nothing after the collapse of the Maoism, but still we, are, we have a lot of, 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 of a way to, to go on. Remember that in 2003 in China there was a very important uh, event, SARS. Remember that uh, epidemic. And after SARS, the government started to do something, and now, now the, the, the green part, the public share of health spending is increasing, and the private part is decreasing. Of course, if people have to pay such amount of money to support their health or the education of their children or their pension, you have an explanation of how China has more than 50% of its GDP saved. 
because this is the way they provide for their future needs and for social needs. Then there is the environment, the last, last point I will stop. This is a clear evidence that China is, is one of the worst situations in terms of environment. It, even India is not a very well placed, but... Uh, and uh, in terms of CO2, this is a very interesting slide because it shows you that in 2028 emission of CO2 from China will exceed North America, Europe and Japan combined. So if it's something must be done in order to reduce CO2 emissions. However, there are some positive signals. Because, for example, energy intensity, which is uh, one of the main uh, parameters to, to analyze the performance of the energy system, and hence also in terms of CO2 emissions, is declining very rapidly, much more rapidly than other countries, including Korea, which is now one of the Eastern Asia countries which is performing better in terms of uh, environment and energy. So there has been a, a, a big progress in terms of uh, reducing energy intensity as a percentage of uh, GDP. And also this is something which must be connected with what Giovanni said before in terms of investment in new technologies in energy and environment, innovation in climate change mitigation technologies, which means also uh, wind power, you see, fuel cells, electric hybrid cars, uh, solar photovoltaics, uh, all these sectors are strongly increasing. Now China is a leader at the world level in the technologies concerning mitigation of climate change. Uh, and they are, so that, that means that we have to change completely our traditional way of uh, addressing problem of international agreement in terms of climate change. So it's not, any, it's, it's not possible uh, to, to face it in terms of technological transfer from developed countries to China, because China is now leapfrogging and transferring technologies to the, the developed world. Uh, this is a final uh, slide, I, I think it's the final one, and uh, uh, just to say that uh, in order to uh, address this imbalance in the growth model and the social issues, these environmental issues, China has to take into consideration a progressive decline of the rate of growth, which is interesting, is accepted as a long run perspective. Uh, a change in the, you see, in the investment GDP ratio which must be reduced, a change in the consumption GDP ratio which must increase, okay, an increase in services, this is the difference which, with India, another aspect which will move China towards the model of a more mature uh, advanced economy. So when China has still uh, still 15, 20 years time to move to, to become uh, an economy like us, like, like our uh, economies.